Greetings. I'm Bern Zampano, and this is the Word of Faith Ministries International Miami Teaching of the Week. Let's pray. Father, anoint your people with eyes to see and ears to hear. Anoint your servant with your word. As we empty ourselves now, vessels for your use, and yield to your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, the saints say in agreement, amen. Satan, we bind you, all unholy seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, wicked spirits in high places, territorials, elementals, strong man spirits on assignment, and all above, around, and below the strong man spirits. All spirits not of the Holy Spirit, all entities not of the Holy Spirit. All of their works and efforts, which we curse at the roots and decree of no effect, and bind up and off all retaliations, counterattacks, judgment, wraths, revenge, or reprisals of Satan in any way, manner, or form, to or through any individual, organization, adversary, or would be adversaries, past, present, even as they arise or to or through anyone, anywhere, at any time, in any manner, for any reason, by any means, for any purpose, in any way, and decree all such immediately, permanently, perpetually forbidden uh, to or through any individual organization, adversary, or would-be adversary, past, present, or even as they arise, or to or through anyone, anywhere, at any time, in any manner, for any reason, by any means, for any purpose, in any way, and decree all such immediately, permanently, perpetually forbidden, and bind them up and off from doing so, all in the authority of the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus, and the saints say in agreement, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, I want to thank uh, everyone in the uh, uh, viewing audience for their patience. Uh, I've been away for a uh, number of weeks uh, ministering up in New York, and uh, it did uh, require a temporary interruption of our teaching series, Understanding Divine Possession, the Sons of God and the Double-Mouthed Sword. And uh, we have one or two sessions of this series left, so uh, I want to uh, pick up where I left off, and uh, the series uh, will be appearing on uh, the YouTube channel uh, in the order in which they were given by date, and most of these presentations are posted uh, within uh, three or four hours of the actual live presentation. Uh, so if you will go to the series, if you would like to see today's video over again, and you would like uh, to go to that series, if you go to our homepage uh, at walkinginpower.org, walking in power is all one word, lowercase letters, no spaces, uh, dot org, O-R-G, uh, and scroll down the home page till you see the YouTube icon. Click on the icon where it says live broadcast or YouTube channel uh, archives, and it will take you directly to the archives. Uh, it'll also take you to our playlist of other teachings as well. Uh, we have been talking about uh, understanding divine possession. And we had been talking also about uh, the double-mouthed sword. In Revelations 1.16, it says of Christ, out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword. But in the original Greek manuscript uh, and the uh, Koine Greek of the New Testament, the literal rendition of that verse is out of his mouth comes a double-mouthed sword. Christ being the first mouth and you and I being the second mouth of the double-mouthed sword, which is the living rhema sword of the Spirit. And uh, we know that 
because Romans 8.16 tells us that uh, his spirit witnesses to our spirit that we are the sons of God. But notice what it says. His spirit witnesses to our spirit. What does it witness to our spirit? What to say, what to do, how to be, what action to take. These are all the functions of the dialogue between uh, Christ and us, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, walking in communion with Christ, walking and talking with God in the cool of the afternoon as did Adam and Eve. You have to remember, Adam and Eve talked with God. Uh, Enoch talked with God. Jacob and Isaac talked with God. Abraham talked with God. Joshua talked with God. Moses talked with God. David talked with God. The apostles talked with God, both before and after the resurrection. And the Holy Spirit guided them. The book of Acts itself is not only an act, uh, the acts of the early church, a history of the early church, it is also a recording of the acts of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit talking with uh, the apostles, talking with Paul and leading them and telling them what to do. It's a living testimony of the double-mouthed sword in and of itself. And so, uh, understanding that this is part of our faith walk, understanding that this is a necessity, not only in our spiritual growth, but in ministry to others and ministry to our loved ones as well, we tune in on a daily basis after self-examination, confession, and repentance. We tune in to the Holy Spirit and we listen, we dialogue, we, we let him speak first. Then we speak when we feel the release. We submit to God, we acknowledge God. And when we do these things, we present ourselves and when we are in the Holy of Holies uh, and presenting ourselves uh, to the Holy Spirit, we then uh, set our heart and mind to receive what he speaks, what he says. And he leads us in our daily thoughts, in our daily actions. Now, this is probably one of the most important teachings in the church today, the double-mouthed sword. I don't know if other ministries uh, are teaching this or not. I would presume so because of the fact that the Holy Spirit is not a respecter of persons. And although he gave me these revelations directly for this series and all, I would not be so presumptuous to believe that I'm the only person teaching this. Because Jesus said the things of the spirit are spirit and the things of the flesh are flesh, aren't they? So we then come to uh, the next question and that is, why does the Holy Spirit do this? What is it that it is his intent uh, in doing this? Well, number one, it's to build the body of Christ, isn't it? That's the first thing. It's also to encourage and develop covenant relationship, isn't it? As well. Third, it's for ministry. To minister the body of Christ, to bring the kingdom to the earth. Isn't that true? These are the purposes why God does these things. 
to develop intimacy within us, intimacy with him. To walk and talk with God, relationship, to know him. You know, people say, uh, what is the most important thing of the Christian faith walk? Is it to go out and do great things for God? No. God doesn't need your help. He doesn't need my help. He's perfectly self-sufficient. He can do anything he wants just by willing it. But he has called the church to minister to the body of Christ, to the world. But is that the prime thing that we need to be preoccupied with in knowing and serving God? No. So what is it that God wants of, out of us? What is the most important thing in the Christian faith walk? Why does God do this? The answer to that is this. There's only one answer. To know him. Period. To grow into knowing him more and more and more. He says in the scripture, draw near unto me and I will draw near unto you. He's talking about knowing. He's talking about fellowship. He's talking about intimacy. He's talking about walking and talking together in the cool of the afternoon. God loves you. God loves me. He loves all of us. He says, I call you friends. I call you brethren, brothers. And we are of his priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, aren't we? All of these things point to intimacy. But guess what? He gives us the double-mouthed sword, the sword of the Spirit, because the kingdom suffers violence and the violent must take it by force. Now that's not physical force. It's spiritual force. It's the use of the anointing. It's the walking in the power of the Spirit. It is the ability to go out and slay your dragons. And nothing less than that. Because guess what? There are dragons out there and they would just love to slay you and your spouse and your children and your grandchildren and your loved ones, your work, everything that they could. Because Jesus said Satan comes to kill, steal, destroy. He has only three ministries. To kill, steal, destroy. And if you let him get away with it, he will do his best to do as much damage as he possibly can, knowing that his time is short. And Jesus said, I give you power to trample over serpents and scorpions and authority over all of the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm you. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit to hear God's voice. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk in victory. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit to conquer your enemies. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit to trample on serpents and scorpions. That's the devil himself, demons, fallen angels, aliens, whatever. You are empowered when you are born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and walking and talking with God. But here is the point. Let's get back to what we said earlier. The kingdom of God suffers violence. 
but the violent take it by force. We have to be spiritually violent, not physically violent. Spiritually violent against the enemy. Many Christians have problems that they don't seem to be able to overcome. That's the purpose of hearing from God. That's the purpose of the double mouth sword which comes out of his mouth in Revelations 1, uh, uh, 16. What does it come out of his mouth for? To communicate with you and me, to lead us into victory, to show us what to do, to permit Christ to live his life in us and through us. That's what it's all about. It's all about intimacy. And so, when he speaks to our hearts, when he speaks to our thoughts, and gives us revelations of what the enemy is doing in our lives, we then are equipped to know what to speak and how to conquer. He equips us. That's part of the faith walk. He equips us. So, you or I may be having all sorts of issues or problems, attacks of the enemy, this or that. What is the purpose then of taking the kingdom by force? Well, the answer is very simple. We all have dragons to slay, don't we? But watch this. You cannot conquer what you do not confront. You cannot confront what you do not identify. Did you hear that? Let me say it one more time. You cannot conquer what you do not confront. You cannot confront what you do not identify. You must know your enemy. God help you if you're sitting in a churchy little church where they teach you, don't talk about the devil, you'll give him glory. You're listening to Satan preaching from the pulpit. That's dangerous thinking. What would the allies in World War II have done if they decided they didn't want to know anything about Hitler? He would have conquered the world. Instead, the intelligence services of four nations monitored him 24 hours a day for six years or eight years. They knew everything about him, his interests, his likes, what he ate, everything. They could predict his movements, his interests, what he would do. And with that knowledge, they conquered him, barely. Satan is no different. He has no power, Burn. What are you preaching about? His power was taken from him, Burn. What are you preaching about? He doesn't need power. Everything he does in the world, he does by lies and deception. Only two things. Lies, deception. And look at the mess the world is in. Look at the mess the church is in. Christians are so confused. There's this massive national movement here in the United States called the Emergent Church Movement that is one of the greatest heresies that has ever risen in the church is now spreading worldwide to water down Christian belief so that it can be intermingled with other world religions and everyone can come into a unity of a watered down 
uh, faith that is characterized by what I call high strangeness. For what purpose? To bring everyone into the new world order. And it is so-called Christian leaders who are bringing the masses in to these emergent churches that don't preach sin, don't preach repentance, don't preach baptism in the Holy Spirit, don't preach water baptism, don't preach the doctrines of the church of Hebrews chapter 6. Paul said, I have preached the full counsel of God. And there are Christians flocking to these churches that are false churches and they can't discern flesh from spirit and neither can their leaders. Jesus said when a blind man leads a blind man, they both fall into a pit. If you're in an emergent church, you get yourself out as quickly as your feet can pitter-patter down the aisle and out the back door. And don't slam the door behind you. Run. <laughs> so, what you need to know is that God has fully equipped you and me to see through these fallacies. Every fallacy that there is. It says in Timothy that Satan will come with all kinds of lying signs and wonders to deceive the elect if it were possible. The Holy Spirit will not permit the elect to be deceived. That's a very interesting concept, isn't it? Because if you find so-called Christians staying in those kinds of environments and they don't come out, the implication of the scripture is they're not the elect. Isn't it? Because the elect cannot be deceived. That's a very sad thing. They need to be prayed for. They need to be petitioned for. See? People get the idea that just because someone uh, uh, loves the Lord and uh, has a ministerial position or has uh, a uh, seminary or a uh, university degree in theology or religion or something like that, that that qualifies them uh, to lead people. A paper given to you by man does not qualify you to do anything. Scripture says a man is called, anointed, and appointed by the Spirit. And if you are not called, anointed, and appointed, you have no business being in a pulpit. And you have no business teaching people about the things of God. You must be filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, Preaching the full counsel of God. That's what it's all about. Otherwise, you're not confronting. In other words, the message today is this. You cannot be tuned in to the Holy Spirit. You cannot be listening to the first voice of the Spirit leading you and not responding.
Why? When the Spirit talks to you, when the Spirit talks to me, that's grace, isn't it? And grace demands a response. And what is the response to grace? The response to grace is obedience. So we must voice what the Spirit voices. We must speak what the Spirit speaks. We must do what the Spirit is doing. We must move in parallel. Why? Because we are called to bring the kingdom to the earth, aren't we? The body of Christ is called to bring the kingdom to the earth. Not to preach a social gospel such as emergent churches preach. but to preach the full counsel of God. That's what transforms people. So we are called to be in tune with the Spirit, listening to His voice, speaking what He says to speak, doing what He says to do, being led by the Spirit, and in so doing understand that you are the second voice of the, of the double-mouthed sword, the sword of the Spirit, and that you are called to bring the kingdom and the purpose of the kingdom to the earth. You are an empty vessel of the Holy Spirit. You are called to be who he says you are, a son of God. And not sons of God by adoption, that does not imply a bloodline. Scripture says that when you are born again, the word there, geneo in the Greek, means generated out of Christ that you are a new creation and therefore you are a son of God, not by adoption. The literal Greek says by the spirit of sonship. Wow, that's Holy Spirit. By an act of the Holy Spirit generated out of Christ. You have a destiny, you have a purpose. God's not a respecter of persons. Stop listening to Satan tell you how lousy you are. Stop listening to devils tell you that you're not worthy. Tell uh, the enemy back when he tells you about the badness of your past. Tell him back about his future. And what the Lord has planned for him. You see, many Christians don't understand the magnificence and the authority and the power uh, that God is bestowing upon them. He's glorifying us slowly in our faith walk. We're sons by the spirit of sonship. Now we have to recognize the things we have to confront. We are at war. Do you understand that? Bible scholars refer to the war between good and evil as the war of the ages. It's been raging and battling for thousands upon thousands of years, if not uh, ages. <clears throat> the war of the ages. And that war must be confronted by us. Because if it is not, and we do not use our authority to protect our loved ones, to protect the church, to protect uh, uh, people that 
uh, God puts on our hearts to intercede for. Or those who come for us for help. If we do not do that, we are failing in our assignment as sons of God. Why? Because that's our purpose, to bring the kingdom to the earth. Now, Satan will wage a war that is a very silent war, that is a very... A subversive war and the purpose of that war is to do two things and this is why God gives us the sword of the spirit the first thing is to create in the mind of every individual be he a Christian or a non-Christian a believer or a non-believer, to build in his soul, his mind, will, and emotions, that's the soul, suke, P-S-U-C-H-E in the New Testament Greek, his first intent, and he orders all of his minions under him to, to uh, produce this ministry in everyone possible, and that is to create in all of us a matrix in our minds. A matrix, a false belief system that very slowly, very insidiously divorces us from the reality of the kingdom of God around us. The target of the matrix is always to destroy the relationship of the individual with the kingdom of God or ever coming into the kingdom of God. Now some of you have seen the movie The Matrix. I'm not promoting the movie The Matrix. I just want to point out one thing. That people in that movie, in that story, lived in an artificial world that they thought was real. And this world was constructed in their thought lives by mind control. And that mind control was caused by a master computer through an assembly of accessory computers that projected reality to the people and created a virtual reality of a false world that they were living in. And there was one man in this situation that understood what it was but could do nothing about it until he came across a young man named Neo. And Neo had the special gift of discernment that he could tell the uh, artificial reality from the real reality and uh, could be used and would know how to destroy the matrix, the false belief system, the false reality. Well, this is all very interesting because the whole movie is a metaphor regarding, uh, or an allegory, I should say, regarding the... Uh, uh, story of good versus evil, uh, the master computer that controls the world is Satan because the Bible says Satan is uh, the prince of the world. Not that Jesus appointed him that, he appointed himself that. And uh, the accessory computers that control people are the fallen angels, the uh, uh, strong man spirits and the demonic spirits under them that minister to all of our thought lives. You see, the matrix is in the Bible. As a matter of fact, those that made the movie, knowingly or unknowingly, borrowed it all from the Bible. Neo 
was a type of Jesus in typology, right? Jesus is the one who knows the way out and the only one who knows the way out. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father but by me. Paul said there is no other name under, uh, 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 what is it? Yeah, under heaven. No other name under heaven by which one may be saved, right? Jesus said, unless you come to know who I am, you will surely perish in your sin. Wow. So Jesus is the way out. But guess what? Those of us who know and understand spiritual warfare, and I've been at this for 36 years, and there are others that have been at it much longer than I have. Um, uh, and, and one of them is uh, my friend Gene Moody, uh, uh, who uh, has written, I think, 23 books on spiritual warfare, and uh, who, uh, as far as I know or am concerned, probably today is uh, 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 what I believe to be uh, the most accomplished uh, and knowledgeable uh, uh, deliverance minister uh, uh, in the world. And, and I say that with great respect. Uh, uh, not to puff him up or to blow him up or, or, or to exalt him in any way, but because I have seen his ministry, I have seen how he operates, I have seen the demonstration of his knowledge. Uh, and uh, he's a humble man who's done everything for the glory of God. Uh, that being said, uh, getting back uh, to our point about the matrix, the matrix can be in the mind of every one of us to some degree or another. A false belief, a false truth, a false or an untruth or a false reality system that is creeping in through television, radio, uh, movies, uh, books, literature, magazines, uh, discussions between believers and non-believers. Satan will interject wherever he can. And given credence, given belief to, uh, passively accepting what you see and hear on television or uh, from uh, pulpits of strange churches, uh, you will incorporate those things and create a reality for yourself to walk in reinforced by the ministrations of the enemy. Now here's the point. You can have an individual matrix, false belief system, or you can have demonic forces ministering to large bodies of people, such as peoples in nations, peoples uh, in uh, states, peoples in cities doing very strange things and creating in them a group matrix. By the way, that is what Bible scholars and deliverance ministers uh, refer to as demonic operations. Demons uh, can minister a seeding, a work, a plan, an activity, a blueprint, plot, plan, or design, uh, an operation. Operations are against nations or large bodies of people. You can see it in politics. You can see it in culture. You can see it in national identities, 
all of those things where people get very proud about who they are and what they want to do. Like Hitler, who wanted to control the world and conquer the world. That was an operation of demons. It's now known by historians that he and his entire upper echelon of officers in his Nazi party were all occultists in operating in the occult, dabbling in the occult, trying to muster up satanic power with which to conquer the world. That's an operation of demons. We see operations of demons uh, on a national level, on a state level, a city level, a village level, a county level, a town level. Uh, we can see operations of demons within families. So these are all different levels of matrices. Matrices is the plural of matrix. False belief systems, which can affect a person spiritually, emotionally, physically. Very often supported by demonic altars and generations' curses through ancestral practices of iniquity. And it's something that many people don't even know or understand. But the Bible tells us about it, and we'll be teaching about this in the very near future. The Bible tells us about how the practice of iniquity of ancestors establish uh, evil foundations in a family's line. Those evil foundations with the practice of iniquity cause a unilateral covenant from Satan to the person without the person knowing it. Then when the covenant is established, uh, the uh, a devil orders the spirit of that practice of iniquity to build an altar to bind the person to that altar and three generations to follow and births a generation's curse in that family line for four generations. The only exception being illegitimacy which goes down ten generations. It needs to be broken. Now, those things are foreign to many Christians. That doesn't make them go away. They will control your lives unless you know what to do, unless you follow the hearing of the first voice of the double mouth sword, the Lord showing you what the steps are to break those things, and then pronouncing it and calling down the fire of God, as did Elijah, on all demonic altars of the false prophets of Baal. And in so doing, decree and declare yourselves divorced from those evil foundations, covenants, demonic altars, generations, curses. And then build and establish an altar to God in their place. And empower your altar with a sacrifice. The New Testament sacrifice is the sacrifice of praise, thanksgiving and praise. But you can give an offering to God. You can give an, uh, an uh, uh, offering, uh, an empowerment of your altar by giving God a tithe, by giving God offerings, by giving uh, God of your time or your uh, uh, ministry or care of others who need care. There's a lot of things that you can use to empower your altar. Praise and thanksgiving is the most powerful because the Lord inhabits the praise. But guess what? Without an offering on the altar, the altar has no power. It's always the offering to God that empowered the altar. So God will tell you 
You can ask God. God will lead you. He will show you how to break these things and get free of this matrix that is affecting you. You see, this artificial reality which Satan tries to build in the minds of every living being, whether you believe it or not, if you don't believe it and you don't do something about it, guess what? Satan, I promise you, Satan is going to have a lot of fun with you. And you're not going to like it. Because it's like going into a maze and trying to find your way out. This is what happens to patients who are suffering from drug addiction. They're bound to an altar. Just, you see, Satan counterfeits everything God does. Everything that God does. There's a counterfeit communion out there. There's counterfeit gifts of the Spirit out there. There's even a counterfeit Jesus out there called every deliverance minister has encountered it now and then called the Jesus of Satan. There's counterfeit voice of God. You have to know how to discern the true from the counterfeit. And how is it? It's by the Spirit of God. It's by listening to the first voice of the double-mouthed sword. It's by acting on what that first voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. You know the voice when it speaks. By discerning what he says to do. To destroy that stuff out of your life. This is a war, folks. And let me tell you something. If you don't become a Christian who knows spiritual warfare and knows how to walk in the authority of the Holy Spirit, by deception, by lies, Satan will try to build a matrix, a false belief system, false ideas that you will passively accept. He'll use every media means to program it. You will fall under his mind control because it's all about mind control. And if you don't get to your children first and pray prayers of protection over your children, I promise you, he will. You just keep promoting passivity. And you see these kids with these video games in front of them. Their minds totally passive. Learning to relate to inanimate objects rather than to people. And then you wonder why they grew up without personalities. Some of their personalities are as appealing as a stepped-on gumdrop. And you wonder why they don't have much in them. They have a matrix built through the virtual reality of those games that are programming them. Do not be a passive parent. Understand the nature of the war. It's a war for the mind. The mind is the soul. It's a war for the mind. Satan wants your children's minds and hearts. He wants to program them with unbelief. He wants to make them into his image and likeness of what he wants them to be. That's the purpose of the matrix. And we all have it in our soul man to some degree or another because our souls are not yet saved completely. They are in the process of being saved. 
That's what Paul said in Romans. Be you transformed by the renewal of your mind. Your mind is your soul. Mind, will, emotions. Suke, P-S-U-C-H-E, in the Greek of the New Testament. Notice, in that verse, Paul says it's in need of renewal. It's in need of salvation. It's a lifetime process. When Christ comes and indwells you, he indwells your uh, spirit man, which is your conscience and intuition. And he resides in your spirit, or spirit man, as the scripture calls it, in the literal Greek. Your spirit man is immediately and completely perfected anew. Where Christ indwells you, there can be no evil. Your soul man needs to be saved. That's a lifetime process. What's the requirement to get into heaven? Matthew 5.48, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The word perfect there means spiritually mature. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We have a problem, don't we? We're not perfect. So Christ solves the problem by taking our sins on himself. In his blood is life. The life is in the blood, the scripture says. In Christ's blood is perfect life, credited to us by his justification of us so that we can ascend to the Father, justified by the blood of Jesus. It's justified, not sinned. So, if we understand that we need that blood, we need that salvation of our soul. And it's a lifetime process that we go through until our soul man is saved by the Spirit through regeneration, and it's a process that that is brought to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Someone might say, what happens, Bern, if I die before my soul is perfected? Because the requirement is be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, to go to the Father. That's the requirement. Well, the answer to that is that uh, he who has begun a good work and you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. What is the day of Christ Jesus? It's either the day of the rapture of the church or the day of your personal rapture, which is your death. That brings you to completion. You enter heaven, completed in the spirit man, completed in the soul man. At resurrection, you'll retrieve a glorified body. You'll be perfect, spirit, soul, and body. Until that time, Satan will battle for that soul. He will do it by creating a matrix. Another thing that he will do is he will try to fragment the soul. That's called soul fragmentation. Did you know that the soul can be fragmented? Psalm 7 verse 2 says the soul can be torn. Did you know that? Entities know how to remove fragments from a person's soul or soul man and uh, the locus or location that it was taken from, uh, they can put a demonic fragment in there. That demonic fragment has a life and thought process of its own. 
If there's a few fragments here or there in the soul, man, most people survive that with little notice or little problem. But as their soul, man becomes more and more fragmented by trauma, by practice of iniquity, by sin, by uh, unholy interests and attitudes, pornography, drugs, to name a few. More and more soul fragments are stolen by the enemy. Ezekiel 13 says they can even be caught with handkerchiefs. Can you believe that? Witches will tell you that they can uh, capture soul fragments and put them in bottles and hold of the person captive. That's where the idea of the genie came from. The Arabs knew that. And so uh, this soul fragmentation causes a soul disintegration. Now let's look at that word. The word integration means to be whole and together, doesn't it? To be integrated means that you are whole, together, you're, you're a put-together person, you're in command of your life guided by the Holy Spirit, if you're a believer. Disintegration implies a falling apart. State hospitals are filled with people whose souls are fragmented. When a soul is fragmented by traumas, by uh, soul stealing or soul uh, uh, fragments, you say, Burn, this stuff is wild that you're talking about. How can this possibly be true? I think you're off of the wall. No, I'm not. I know very well what I'm saying and doing. Because in this ministry and in many spirit-filled ministries in third world countries where the practices of witches, warlocks, and shamans are very, very common and all pastors over there know about it. They know about soul fragmentation and they know about soul capture, soul exchange, uh, uh, soul stealing, and all of those techniques of uh, high strangeness that uh, are practiced by shamans, witches, warlocks, medicine men, and the like, and they know how to call those things back and reintegrate people, and they get better, and we have done it in this ministry many times. So we know that these things are real and that these things exist. Let God be true and every man a liar. So when the soul fragmentation takes place and you see that the person cannot function. Have you ever seen street people uh, who are homeless and they're on drugs? You know they're on drugs. Their eyes uh, are cloudy uh, and maybe they're unkept and they're sweaty and they're wandering and they're going about like this on the street. How many have ever seen people like that? Look at that. All the hands are up. Of course, we've all seen that. And their thinking processes are slowed down. And they're wandering about. And, and they may ask for a quarter or a penny or something like that. And very few words come out of their mouth. That's soul fragmentation. Their souls are fragmented. And they need to be given the gospel. And, and we must invite and command, decree and declare, warrior angels to go forth to do battle for them and to retrieve their soul fragments by force, to wash them in the blood of Christ Jesus 
and to bring them back, displace demonic or alien fragments out of them, cast them to the pit and chain them there till the great white throne judgment, cleanse the locations with the blood of Christ Jesus, re-implant those soul fragments back into them, call them back, re-implant them into them and seal them in with the blood of Christ Jesus so they can never again be stolen in Christ Jesus' name. And then watch what happens over time. You decreed by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of power and might of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we decree these three place soul fragments reactivated and the purpose and destinies of these people or of this person reactivated and come forth now in the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus to the glory of the Father in Christ Jesus' name. And watch and see what happens over time. You start seeing them becoming alive again. You start seeing them become uh, more mature again. A type of soul fragment is also called maturation arrest. Through traumas, through deceptions, through lies of the enemy, or even soul uh, stealing of fragments or things like that, people's development of the soul man can be arrested. And when they are arrested, they cannot come forth to their spiritual chronological age of their physical man or to maturity. Trauma is a very common cause of this. Even trauma before birth, at birth, or after birth through words spoken over the fetus or over a child or through threatened abortion which very often, if the child doesn't get aborted, ends up uh, producing uh, young children who during their formative years are very fearful. Why? Because their soul man in the womb heard everything that was being discussed. That's why. And so what ends up happening is that if the fragmented soul doesn't grow to, through, to, to fullness of the chronological age, you have an adult who has a maturation, a soul maturation of the soul man arrested, and they may, be, they may behave somewhat childish or infantile and not understand what's happened to them or why it's happened to them. Not uncommon at all. We had a woman uh, in our ministry many, many years ago, she's since passed away, uh, who uh, was uh, the daughter of a very famous surgeon. And uh, she was 17 years old. She had uh, a uh, young man she fell in love with and she wanted a relationship with him very badly. And the father did not approve of the relationship. And he cut it off and told her that she could not see him. She could not marry him. She went into an immediate depression, had to be hospitalized. The rest of her life, she uh, was re-hospitalized for chronic depression at least three or four times. When she was in our ministry here, she was 72 years old. And uh, one day she got jealous uh, of uh, a circumstance uh, where someone was giving me some attention. And uh, I don't pretend to know the reason why, but uh, the uh, person confronted her about it and she lost control of her emotions. And uh, she started accusing the other person of being an evil spirit. And she 
was standing in front of those of us that were around and she was jumping up and down like this, yelling and screaming like a 15-year-old uh, teenager. And I realized this was maturation arrest. She had never been healed of the traumas and the soul man never called forward to maturity. And that's a requirement. There was a, another situation of a, a young woman who loved a young man in, in our ministry. Uh, and uh, 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 who are very uh, close uh, to me, actually. And uh, he wanted to get married, but she just couldn't get married. And they went on for several years, and she just did not want to get married. And when she talked, she talked with the voice of a little girl. And uh, that... Uh, 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 was a sign of maturation arrest of the soul man. Her history revealed that she had had a traumatic... Uh, childhood with some repeated uh, relation, uh, 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 not relationships, but uh, 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 stressful uh, uh, encounters uh, uh, with a member of her family. Uh, I can't remember if it was her father or her brother or something like that. But anyway, uh, it, it was such that it traumatized her and arrested her, uh, and this happened when she was about six, seven years old. And uh, uh, she, she was fearful of getting married. Well, we decided that her soul man needed ministry. So, and she wanted that. And, and so we started to call the soul man forward to maturity. And I asked her, uh, the Old Testament scripture says, without a vision, the people perish. Without a vision, the people perish. So I asked her to yield to the Holy Spirit and to close her eyes. And she did. And I said, now I want you to picture uh, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, reaching his hands out. Put your hand in his hand. He's right here. You've asked him to be here. He's here by faith in his name. And he will walk you forward to maturity. And you can tell me what age you are as you take the steps forward. And she says, okay. And I said, tell me when you see Jesus' hand out in front of you. And uh, she, she says, I see it. I said, Put your hand in his hand. She says, no. I said, why? She said, I'm afraid. I said, Jesus will not hurt you. Jesus loves you and he will protect you. Put your hand in his hand and just take one or two steps to see. I said, how old are you now? She says, six. I said, put your hand in his hand. Uh, and she, I said, do you have your hand in his hand? She says, yes. I said, ask the Lord Jesus Christ to walk you forward now to your mature age. And, and I said, pray these words with me. Jesus, please walk me forward to my mature age. I ask it in your name. I give you thanks and praise. And I said, now Jesus is moving you two, three steps forward. What age are you now? And she says, I'm nine. I said, praise God. I said, let's go forward. Watch Jesus walk you forward. Now go with him. Don't be afraid. The angels are protecting you anyway. And I said, how old are you now? She says, I'm 15. And then we went on until we got to about 20 or 21. And I said, how old are you now? And she says, 
I'm 21. Her voice changed and became mature. And she was 29, and we walked her all the way to the age of 29. And I said, how old are you now? She says, I'm 29. And I said, give Jesus thanks, praise, and glory. Guess what? Within three or four months of that, or I think maybe six months of that, Nora, they were married. Can you believe that? What was it that was hindering their marriage? Soul maturation arrest. Her soul man didn't have the maturity to enter into a relationship. And with healing of soul fragmentation, she came into a chronological age where her, her soul man, her spirit man, and her physical man were all whole. That's reintegration. That's what that's called. You see? And this is led by the sword of the Spirit, which is the double mouth sword, where the Holy Spirit shows you what to do. And that helps to destroy the matrix. And you can invite and command warrior angels of the Lord Christ Jesus to come forth and to ambush all strongholds within the mind, to destroy the matrix, to tear down the false belief systems, like, I really need these drugs. Oh, I've got to have a fix. That's all matrix thinking. And it has to be called down and destroyed. You know, I, uh, I invite and command, Father, warrior angels of the Lord Christ Jesus, to come forth right now, to go forth to so-and-so and to ambush that stronghold in them and to tear it down and break that matrix in Christ Jesus' name. Father, in Christ Jesus' name, I decree uh, a straight uh, path cut to the heart, mind, soul, and spirit of so-and-so and your light and truth shining in to destroy that matrix in the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus. All in Christ Jesus' name. When we have an understanding of these types of things, We can affirm our authority in Christ. We can yield to the Holy Spirit. We can step forward and we can even pray general prayers that will change lives. Are you ready? I would like to pray for you right now. Maybe there's a stronghold in your life that you need to be freed from. Jesus came to set the captives free. And if you would like to be free, we can pray a prayer now to break the matrices, to ambush all soul fragmentation, to call forth reintegration of the soul man. Your thinking will become normalized. Your believing will become normalized. You will be strengthened in the inner man. God will make you whole for the asking. If you do not know Jesus, this is the time. This is the day of decision. And if you are ready, God is ready. You never get an experience of God unless you reach out to him first. And so I would ask you now, 
if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, to invite Christ into your heart now. It'll be a life-changing experience you will never regret. If Jesus has a way in, Jesus has a way out for you, whatever your circumstances. Pray this prayer aloud now, won't you? Being willing to turn from your sin, and then we're going to pray a prayer to destroy the matrix that Satan is trying to build in you and a prayer to heal the soul. Say these words aloud, won't you? Being willing to turn from your sin, the Lord Christ Jesus will do all the rest. Just say these words. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Every sinner needs a Savior. I need a Savior. I invite you into my heart to be Lord, that is to lead me through life, and Savior, that is to save me from sin, self, and circumstances. I confess you before men as the resurrected Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I dispatch warrior angels right now to stop that lightning and to stop that rain and to stop the loss of power in the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus. And I bind the enemy up and off in Christ Jesus' name. Let's continue. And I confess you before men as my Lord and Savior. I receive you by trusting faith alone. I thank you for the free gift of eternal life. I give you thanks, praise, and glory. Amen. Are you ready? Open your hearts now to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be ready to receive. Be ready to receive. Father, in Christ Jesus' name, by the spirit of power and might of the Holy Spirit, I release warrior angels of the Lord Christ Jesus to go forth to every person watching and to ambush every stronghold and mind matrix that is leading them astray in any way from the Lord Christ Jesus and to break those things off in the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus. And I say to you in Christ Jesus' name, be made whole now in Christ Jesus' name. All in Christ Jesus' name. Father, I invite and command warrior angels of the Lord Christ Jesus to go forth right now to all who are watching and to retrieve their soul fragments wherever they are, wherever they've been stolen from them. Cleanse them by the blood of Christ Jesus including their locations in their soul. Displace all demonic or alien fragments. Uh, cast them to the pit, chain them there till the great white throne judgment. Wash those locations with the blood of Christ Jesus. By the spirit of power and might of the Holy Spirit, I call those soul fragments reintegrated into every person watching. In the name and by the blood of Christ Jesus, I call your soul fragments forth. I call your soul men forth to maturity in Christ, to your chronological age. Be made whole now, body, soul, and spirit, in Christ Jesus' name. Do we decree and agree? 
and seal those fragments in by the blood of Christ Jesus in the name of Christ Jesus. Be made whole now in Christ Jesus' name. We give you thanks, praise, and glory, Father, in Christ Jesus' name. We give you thanks, praise, and glory, Holy Spirit, in Christ Jesus' name. We give you thanks, praise, and glory, Lord Jesus, in your name. Be made whole. All in Christ Jesus' name. Well, we're out of time. Thanks for watching. Until next week. God willing, we'll meet again and continue our series. Until then, God bless you. Have a great week. Bye-bye.